question of what... oh, excuse me, uh, I'm being recorded. My apologies. Um, so for those of you just joining us, uh, here's a little bit of illustrating mathematics. Um, for my next illustration, since uh, there are many of them, this is a piece of Euclid's elements. And um, I think it's proving the distribu distributivity of multiplication over addition. And so it's being done with some rectangles. I, I would just like to point out as a bit of history, which I think is awesome, which is that this is, um, I, I guess the versions of Euclid that we know about, um, there's very little that's actually in original papyrus. Um, most of them were copied from the Greek to Arabic and then to Latin. And then the versions that I look at are in English. So this transmission is just part of the contribution of um, sort of these streams of ancient uh, mathematics to the modern day. And things come to us in this very kind of um, interesting fragmented way. Uh, jumping forward in time quite a bit, this is from the uh, 1800s, unlike the papyrus, um, but again, it's Euclid, so I wanted to give it at the same time. And the, the title of this book by Oliver Byrne is The First Six Books of the Elements of Euclid in which colored diagrams and symbols are used instead of letters for the greater ease of learners. Um, and uh, this work is in the public domain. You can find copies of this online. And it's kind of nice to, to read it and try and see what it's saying alongside a piece of more traditional Euclid. Um, here's something from the 1600s, so jumping back. That's uh, the Pythagorean theorem. And I think the point is that it's a copy of something from the uh, 1100s. Um, and it's sort of an independent uh, pr production of Pythagoras' theorem. Uh, this I found out from uh, the book by George Joseph, who has uh, called The Crest of the Peacock, Non-European Roots of Mathematics. Unfortunately, I don't have any uh, solid examples from Egyptian mathematics, which I would love to hear about if anyone knows of those. Here's a rather more, uh, I think, famous example of mathematical illustration due to um, Leonardo da Vinci from a book uh, by Lusa, I'm not gonna pronounce it correctly, so my apologies, uh, Divina Proportioni in the 1500s, but the figures are maybe a bit earlier. And uh, um, this kind of, um, we've already seen a little bit of this today in Arnaud's talk of this business of just drawing the one skeleton and sort of showing what's behind. Um, and I don't know where this is first due to, but this is the earliest uh, example I could find in the literature. In a slightly different direction, but still I think a good example of a historical illustration. So there's not very many pictures here, but there is this sort of cartoon in the, um, in the margin here, which is showing an example uh, of the sum of the first five odd numbers giving a perfect square. And uh, this manuscript by Francis Mariolis, um, two books on arithmetic from the 1500s, is one of the earliest examples of uh, in, um, well, induction being used to prove something. Now, induction sort of shows up and there's discussions of whether or not induction appears in Greek mathematics, but this is like a rock solid, you can't, can't complain. He introduces the idea of induction and he uses it to prove various easy things. So um, we also, uh, there was a discussion of 3D models by Glenn Whitney. Here is something which is literally 3D printed. And in fact, it's 3D printed almost in the same way that modern 3D prints are produced. Um, this is produced by the German school in 1880. Um, you can find copies of the Brill catalog, which contains many such uh, beautiful objects. The photo is by uh, Hiroshi Sugimoto. And um, this is illustrating some of the straight lines. Um, I believe this is not the classic 27 lines on the cubic. Instead, this is the Klepsch diagonal surface. Um, and how is it made? I believe what's going on here is that they produce cross sections by hand, they graph cross sections, they made them out of plaster, the cross sections, they would then glue the cross sections together and then produce a, and then finish, smooth the boundary. So this is literally printed 
two-dimensional slice by two-dimensional slice with then an after process to uh, get the nice effects of the lines and so on. Apparently the plaster is made from powdered chalk, bone glue, double varnish, essence of lavender and essence of clove. Um, my next slide is another illustration moving slightly further towards modern. This is uh, Tate's first tables of knottedness. And we note that, uh, first of all, the unknot is missing. The, uh, that's not there. And also he doesn't write down the crossings because I think at this point in time, he thought that maybe all knots were alternating. So there was no need for the over and under convention. I think the, the title here is a pun, the first seven orders of knottedness. Um, here is a uh, image by possibly Klein himself. I, I found this in a uh, library at UIUC, and it's one of Klein's earlier papers. And even in his early papers, you still have this kind of incredible draftsmanship. So it's before he's such a huge shot. There's speculation as to whether Klein employed draftspeople or whether he made the images himself. Um, another image, also somewhat incredible, this appears in a work by Frick and Klein. Um, and again, uh, at least uh, Samuel Peterson suggests, uh, sorry, Patterson suggests that maybe um, Frick drew this himself. He was a son of a, of a technical, he was, uh, of course, a professor of mathematics, but he was also the child of a, in a technical family. Um, so uh, we'll return to this later, but um, yet another example, uh, again, drawn by hand, uh, presumably by Poincaré himself. This is the first example of a Hegard splitting. Uh, again, the later 1800s. So I, I realize that I'm not uh, taking the time to explain all of these things. I just wanted to point out that uh, in the history of mathematics, all these things are, are showing up and everything's sort of very hand-drawn as will be the next, the next few examples, but then we'll go to uh, quite a different direction. And I just want to show the early pictures so you can see that you know uh, some of them are really remarkable and some of them are very straightforward. Uh, here's another quite straightforward picture. Um, so one of the standard mathematical illustrations that one learns about uh, even uh, I think the person on the street might know what a fractal is and they'd say like, oh, I think I've heard of those fractals. So here's a hand-drawn picture by Julia. I believe that this is the first picture of a Julia set. So it's maybe not quite as richly illustrated as the ones we've come to expect. Here's another hand-drawn picture of a Julia set by um, Thomas McFarland Cherry. So um, the one by, if I can go backwards in my slides, uh, well, the one by Julia, is um, part of his submission for the, the prize in 1905 or something um, in the famous competition between Julia and Fatou. This is a picture by uh, Cherry. It's in the 60s, so 60 years later. Um, and I would dearly like to know if this picture was inspired perhaps by computer work because uh, Thomas Cherry was the director of computation at the University of uh, Melbourne, and um, he had access, he was, I mean, he was the person who kept machines running. So I was wondering if this picture is somehow informed by computer experiments he did. Um, another connection to computers that will come a little bit later, this is the first physical model in um, 1968, four years after the picture of the Julius that we just saw, that approximates the gyroid. Um, the first triply periodic surface discovered in more than 80 years. And um, this is made with a vacuum forming machine, but uh, Schoen explains that it's a toy. He actually bought a children's toy and used it to make this object. He also rediscovered the um, Schwartz P and the uh, Schwartz D surfaces. And maybe I should, um, maybe to indicate what's kind of coming a little bit sooner, a lot of these things have been in aid of, um, let's say, expositional or um, 
uh, teaching, the teaching of mathematics. The German sculpture models were explicitly sold as for use in pedagogy. But this one, this is a really solid example of something that predates the mathematics. So Schoen finds this experimentally and he says, I think that this is a new um, uh, minimal surface. And uh, the theorem that this thing exists, but well, so he makes this in the late 80s and the fact that it exists uh, comes in the 90s. So about 10, sorry, 30, I'm getting my chronology wrong. Uh, he makes it in 68 and it's proven to exist in 96. So here is an example where one absolutely cannot dispute the, the, the firstness of the illustration. The illustration comes first and 30 years later, the theorem arrives. Um, and I'll give a few other examples of that uh, in a moment. Um, but first, I just like to point out <coughs> two examples by uh, George Francis. Um, and when I first saw these, I was, I was sort of amazed. I've always been a big fan of graphical arts and I grew up on sort of American comic books. Um, and then when I saw this kind of almost cartoonish style combined with mathematical content, um, this is a picture of Joan Berman's favorite involution. It's a map of the two torus to itself, right? And it's uh, this axis right here, this is kind of like the, um, the spit and the surface spins around by uh, 180 degrees. And if we mod out, if we take the quotient by this involution, the hyperliptic involution, then we get the two sphere. And the two sphere uh, that we get has these four special points. There's one here, there's one underneath you can't see. There's another one underneath you. Well, I guess we put it here and here actually. So the four fixed points are here, here, there, and there. I wanted to instinctively align them vertically because that's how they're aligned on the spit. Um, but that's not how he's drawing them here. And another marvelous illustration, um, also due to George Francis, of the cyclic surface of the figure eight knot. Right. So the figure eight was the second knot that appeared in Tate's table um, after the trefoil. And this has a very delicate um, structure. And uh, as an amusing story, um, Thurston had the wonderful um, fortune to meet George Francis, and George Francis realized that Thurston was very clever and offered to illustrate Thurston's articles. So Thurston has two quite famous bulletin articles in the uh, Bulletin of the American Mathematical Society, one on um, dynamics and one on topology, and the, um, the hand-drawn illustrations are due to George Francis in both cases. The computer illustrations in those figures are either Thurston or um, Riley, Bob Riley. Um, let me just add one sort of comment about the art style here, um, or maybe just a comment about how to draw surfaces. We see that uh, George Francis is making a very strong distinction between the knot, which is drawn as sort of a core, and which is the knot is the boundary of the surface. But you see there's another kind of boundary, which is drawn in a different style. It doesn't have the kind of core. This is the visual tangent to the surface. This is where the ray that emits from your eye and goes to the surface is just tangent to the surface. And because this causes uh, issues, right? One gets confused, is this part of the boundary or not? He draws the surface in another style uh, right here, where he takes this region behind and he pulls it out to infinity. So now this is the cyclic surface minus a square. And also he's been a bit cheeky and he's signed it for us. Um, here's a picture by uh, Flamenco, which is illustrating um, one way to try and take off your watch. There's a person who's uh, holding their hands together. And uh, the, uh, the question is, can we get, get the watch off? And uh, the hands morph in this way. And also the person becomes perfectly spherical and gives an illustration that the watch here is secretly being a commutator curve in the complement of the handle body. Uh, right, uh, two more slides, one more slide from the past. And this is not really past. I shouldn't uh, say that this is old, this is quite recent, 2009. And um, 
but still this is explicitly by hand illustration of uh, mathematical content. This is a picture of a bit of a hyperbolic plane. And here is a beautiful um, fabric art torus, solid torus. Although I guess the, 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 the solid part is probably stuffing, I would guess. Um, and you can see very beautiful um, things about how one has to arrange the fabric in order to get the correct kind of geometry. Right, so I wanted to kind of pause there. I've been talking for about a third of the talk and I wanna say, so uh, let me call that the past because everything is sort of done by hand. So let me, let me now come into some sort of present. And by that, I mean the advent of the computer. So um, mathematics can be illustrated by hand as we've seen in these, I think, quite beautiful examples, but uh, one gets a different kind of illustration, um, perhaps less organic, but um, vastly more, it's possible for it to be vastly more detailed using the machine. And um, I'm very, very happy to have found the first two examples. This is a, uh, I believe, as far as I understand, the first computer generated picture of a Julia set. There are rumors of earlier ones due to Hubbard, but I can't find those in any publication. This is Brooke Matelski in their paper uh, from uh, 1980. It's called the Dynamics of Two Generator Subgroups of PSL2C. And this is uh, pixel graphics. <laughs> and it's, it's uh, they put a dot everywhere they think there's a point of the uh, 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 filled Julia set. So why is this paper so amazing? It's because this paper also contains the first picture of the Mandelbrot set, which is uh, nicely before Mandelbrot's first pictures of the Mandelbrot set. Uh, he has a picture which he, which he points at in uh, 1982, but this is 1980. And his picture is in fact of a, of a different set. So <laughs> I'm not quite sure why it's called the Mandelbrot set, not the Brooks Matelski set, but Mandelbrot does this amazing Job of popularization. And I think that that's possibly the reason why we all know and love it as the man of Ross set today. Um, I believe that this is an escape time algorithm. So for each one of these black pixels, they wait. And if, uh, if it doesn't wander off to infinity, then they paint it black. Uh, for these white pixels, they wait. If it gets bigger than some predetermined radius, then they color it white. So, um, Pixel graphics uh, don't last too long in this story because uh, here's a picture by Thurston, which is four years later, excuse me, two years later. The uh, pixel graphs, graphics we were just looking at were um, by Brooks and Matelski in 1980. This is a picture by Thurston of the, uh, a bit of approximation of the Canon Thurston map. And I believe that this is vector graphics. It's a lots and lots of little segments. And uh, I think the standard joke about this picture is when it's drawn correctly, the square should be perfectly black. What's going on is that the, the curve that Thurston is drawing and which we're trying to, which he's giving approximation of, the curve that he's approximating, in fact, goes everywhere in the square. And the reason why this approximation doesn't go everywhere is because it's having a hard time kind of working its way into these regions. There's these regions which sort of repel uh, his attempts to draw the curve. You can see that there's these kind of octopus heads, which have octopus heads, which have octopus heads, which have octopus heads. And eventually the octopus heads gets too small and his algorithm stops drawing them and kind of uh, gives up. Right, so we'll, we'll return to this later. I should say that there is related work um, slightly earlier by Riley, but um, that tends not to appear in his publications. He has, uh, Riley has uh, a plotter. He, he, he had access to a plotter, so he could draw uh, using a pen plotter uh, various interesting things, but I fortunately do not have uh, copies of those in the talk. Finally, we see the advent of um, the very, this is the first example I could find of uh, a rendered uh, mathematical illustration. This is due to Hoffman and Weeks. It is a bit of the uh, Costa surface, I believe. 
unless I'm getting that wrong. Uh, and I have a quote from the paper. We computed the coordinates of the surface and drew computer pictures of it. Observing that it looked embedded and it had dihedral symmetry, we were motivated to prove these observations mathematically. So again, this is a strong example where the illustration predates the mathematics. Um, the picture comes first and the theorem comes second. Uh, here is the first example I could find of a mathematical object being 3D printed. This is uh, the trefoil knot uh, produced by Stuart Dixon. So this is the first knot in Tate's tables. Um, and this was apparently custom programmed by Stuart Dixon. Um, this dates to 1989. And, and I think I've said this several times, but I would be deeply grateful to anybody who uh, has earlier examples of, of any of these kinds of phenomena, either computer produced or hand produced. Again, an example where the picture precedes the, the theorem. Uh, with Mandelbrot's popularization and with more sophisticated algorithms for drawing the Mandelbrot set, um, I believe Milner makes uh, various conjectures. And one of the conjectures is that there should be regions in the Mandelbrot set, uh, of, in the boundary, not the interior, regions of the boundary of the Mandelbrot set where the Hausdorff dimension is uh, two. So this conjecture is proved by Lubovitch, I'm probably mispronouncing the name, in the annals in 1999. These are two of the illustrations from the, uh, the paper. I believe that he is zooming in and you see the beginnings of a baby Mandelbrot set developing here. But the thing that he's trying to point out is that it's very hairy, right? The, uh, the dimension looks like it's going up. Everyone who saw, uh, here's a quote from the paper. Everyone who saw computer pictures of the Mandelbrot set realized that it was not self Um and uh, then there's further quotes from that paper, which you can find where uh, Lubitsch is saying, I made this computer experiment, I made this computer experiment, uh, and that convinced me that the following had to be true, and then the theorem comes. Let me give uh, another 3D printed example due to Batshiva Grossman. This is a uh, three, so uh, remember Schoen's gyroid was made out of vacuum forming, this is 3D printed. It's actually quite a complicated process. Um, when 3D prints in a kind of um, powder, powdered steel, excuse me, and binder. So you take steel, which is kind of dust, steel dust, you apply glue to it, and then you do a bronze infusion because the powdered steel, the, the glue is very weak. You inject uh, molten bronze into it in order to get a fairly indestructible object. It's um, identical, that is the way that this thing is produced is similar to the way that the German plaster models were produced. Namely, it's printed layer by layer and then um, there are after effects done to it to make it solid, to make it shiny. Here's another two-dimensional illustration of a uh, canter set um, or rather a filled uh, not cancer site, excuse me, I'm getting confused. This is a picture of a um, circle packing, let's say, or a disc packing, better. And the bright colors are indicating the limit set of a certain Kleinian group. This picture is due to David Wright, and it's one of the many beautiful pictures contained in the book Indra's Pearls, which I should just get down and also show off if I'm uh, trying to do advertisements. I highly recommend this book. Um, even if you only look at pictures and things, it's wonderful to have. Um, this is again, vector graphics. Here is another example of rendering uh, due to Joe Slays, uh, drawn on behalf of Etienne Gis. And maybe I should uh, take a moment to say that this is um, another example in a long line of mathematicians reaching out to uh, illustrators and the two of them together making something which is quite uh, amazing. Uh, this is just one frame from Etienne um 2006 ICM address. And the, 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 the presentation is absolutely gorgeous. I, I can't recommend it enough. You can find it on YouTube. 
Again, let's just point out that in the background lurking is the um, trefoil knot. And since the trefoil knot has this sort of arithmetic nature, it's related to um, SL2Z, you can use that and um, the, the action of SL2R on itself to produce other knots in the complement of the trefoil knot. And that's what this, this thing is. It's, um, it's an image of a certain subgroup of um, SL2R giving you a curve in the complement of the torus knot. Trefoil knot, sorry. Um, I just wanted to um, point out that uh, the HNG's uh, sort of draws pictures, well, with, with Joe Slays, of course, draws pictures of this family of uh, extra knots and the complements of the uh, trefoil knots. And I think I am making a, a, a slight mistake here. I believe that the wiggly thing is also a, okay, I shouldn't, I shouldn't, uh, I, I think the, the, the details are escaping me at the moment, but um, you can see that this is kind of fellow traveling the uh, trefoil knot in a certain way, but it's getting very wiggly. And in this family, there are things which are more and more wiggly. And um, you can draw pictures of them and you notice that the wiggly members of the family are wiggling so much that they seem to fill up uh, the space in some sort of a uniform way. And uh, uh, G says, it is known that the family of curves tends to fill up the space in a uniform way, but the quantitative estimate uh, is equivalent to the famous Riemann hypothesis. So there are things you can draw pictures of and become convinced that it's true, but to actually be able to prove the theorem in that case requires you to prove the Riemann hypothesis. Uh, oh, and as promised, I'm now returning to this picture, uh, perhaps by um, Fricka and uh, our very own Ar uh, uh, Arnaud Charitain, who spoke earlier, has given the corresponding uh, computer picture. So let me see if I can actually go back and forth. I'm going to try and go back and forth here. Uh, yes, good, I can go back and forth. So here is the hand-drawn picture from 1897. And here is a picture by Arnaud Charitain from 2009. And I'm just gonna go back and forth here. And I'm going to allow, this is the one animation that I'm allowing myself because Zoom is not so friendly to animations. And I just want to observe the incredible quality of the original. I mean, of course, the, the beauty and the very, very nice color choice, by the way, of the, the new version, but the, the kind of the amazing quality of the original. So um, there was, there's certain academic uh, in the literature in the uh, 80s, before um, I think these things were sorted out, there was some discussion about what this dark crinkly line might be and whether it's a good approximation or a bad approximation of the, uh, this piece of the limit set. But I think you can be convinced by Arnold's picture that it's a quite good approximation. And whoever drew this was doing an incredibly good job. And uh, one more picture by Arnaud Charitain. Um, if, if I may, I hope that's okay. This is a picture which is uh, uh, illustrating the a quadratic polynomial with the Julia set having positive Lebesgue measure. So you can kind of see, well, I mean, maybe the pictures don't do the theorem justice in this case. And it's not clear to me that you can actually be convinced that the theorem is true or false. I think there's a bit of a, uh, a leap of faith that one has to be really convinced that the pictures are proving that this has area and then you have to go and prove it. So this is a, um, uh, another example where the pictures are suggesting something, but the theorem really needs uh, to be proven. Uh, but just to quote Arnaud, if I may, I hope you don't mind. He says in his uh, paper about uh, this topic in 2012, I've been able to reduce Duoday's conjecture to another suggested by known analogous results and encouraging computer experiments. So perhaps not the power of illustration as much as the power of um, experimental mathematics. Right, so in the last uh, maybe seven minutes of my talk, I wanted to just talk a little bit about my own work, um, which maybe is a mistake uh, after showing you so many very beautiful things, uh, both from uh, the ancients and from much more recent work, but um, maybe, as some light relief, 
and more examples of computer printed mathematics. Uh, all of this will be joint work with Henry Sabin. Um, right, so uh, Arnaud again was speaking about his great uh, affection for the 120 cell. Um, and uh, I also uh, have a great affection for it. Um, although I haven't thought about it nearly as deeply. Here is a puzzle that uh, Henry and I made. You can see um, these dodecahedra, there are these bits of the 120 cell. This is all coming from the stereographic projection of the 120 cell. Um, Arnaud earlier was showing these kind of more orthogonal projections. Um, each one of these chains of dodecahedra is coming from a subgroup of the binary icosahedral group. Uh, those subgroups all have order 10, and we're just showing little bits of those subgroups. And um, sorry, this is the subgroup. These are cosets of the subgroup. And because the subgroup and its cosets tie all the group, it follows that you can assemble these pieces into a, a single piece. And this is about approximately, um, well, it's 45, um, cells out of the 120 cell. So it's all living in like one half of the 120 cell. In fact, there are other ways to assemble these pieces and to get other kinds of shapes, which all live in the 120 cell as well. Here is a picture of a ciphered surface for a torus knot. I believe this is the 4-3 torus knot. Um, this is all, also called a Milner fiber. Uh, you can actually uh, quartetize the Ciphered surfaces uh, using this technique due to Milner, you write your surf your knot as the zero locus of some polynomial in um, C2, and then taking something about angles, you can obtain a surface. And this is a projection of uh, that surface in S3. First, you project from C2 into S3, then you stereographically project into R3, and you get this kind of uh, spanning surface for this torus knot. Um, here's another version of the figure eight knot, now drawn in this sort of inside out um, aspect. So again, this figure eight knot, this is the cord that um, George Francis was drawing. And just like he took a bit of the ciphered surface and pushed it past infinity, what we're doing here is we're pushing the cord past infinity. So it goes from being a cord to being sort of a uh, ball. You could think of this as an apple where you've trained a worm to eat a wormhole through the apple along a figure eight knot. This is joint work with Francis Garrido. I'm going to, in the interest of time, skip past a few slides. So I apologize, Henry, for not spending enough time on uh, these various pieces of work. Oh, excuse me, sorry. Um, and I'm going to skip these as well. These are various kinds of, uh, of, well, they're sort of a fractal, but they're not actually a fractal. I'll just leave uh, that to your imagination and talk about more recent work, since all of that was uh, sort of historical, which relates back to this work of um, uh, Cannon and Thurston. So what we're seeing here uh, in this colorful curve is a version of a Canon Thurston map. This is joint work with uh, Jason Manning as well as with Henry. Um, so let me just, if I may, in my three minutes remaining, I think, my apologies, just give a quick discussion of what the, um, the Canon Thurston map is. Well, so one begins with a knot and um, one drills the knot out of the space, and one uses that to build a three-dimensional space, which is sort of what the knot is not, the complement of the knot, if you like. And um, this cartoon here is meant to illustrate that the complement of the knot is actually filled up by surfaces, which is a cartoon, uh, something that we all already saw illustrated by George Francis. So Thurston proves um, that, well, here's a, uh, another copy of Thurston's picture, and Cannon and Thurston prove that uh, these uh, surfaces, these spanning surfaces for the knot, they actually reach out, if you lift to the universal cover, they reach out in a certain way 
to the boundary at infinity and they fill the boundary at infinity, which is a two sphere, uh, they give a sphere filling curve. So this is one of the first um, natural examples, if you like, of a piano curve, of a space filling curve. And uh, what uh, Jason and Henry and I prove is that um, these kinds of maps exist for varying triangulations, you don't actually need the surface itself. You don't need a knot, you don't need the surface. You do need hyperbolic space, but the varying triangulation will give you another source of these Canon Thurston maps. So uh, here's another visualization of uh, Thurston's uh, idea. You have this surface and we uh, unwrapped it to live in its universal cover. So now it lives in three space instead of inside of the complement of the knot. And as it unwraps, um, it's reaching out to infinity in sort of this crinkly way. And you can see that the feet of this surface are giving you a, um, a boundary at infinity, and that is indeed Thurston's curve. So um, instead of building the, the curve that way, um, instead of using a disk, let's see if I can go back, Thurston is using this, this infinite disk, this infinite diameter disk to build his curve. So instead of using a disk, we are going to use a three ball in a certain way. And instead of explaining, um, I'm just going to uh, let the pictures wash over you and show the last picture. So here is the, our three ball, which is giving a bit of a curve. Uh, that's the top of the three ball. This is the bottom of the three ball. Uh, here's the three ball again, giving some of the curve. Here's a larger three ball. Uh, this is us kind of trying to use Thurston's uh, technique, where we just go out and make this disk. And you can see that it's it's producing things in a fairly nice way, but there are regions where it's busier and regions, regions where it's less busy. Here's yet another picture. If we pay attention to the top and the bottom of the ball, so we don't just like go outwards along the disk, but if we also go outwards in the, the extra upper and lower directions, then we can fill space a little more evenly. Uh, also, the fact is that the ball has a top and a bottom. That is to say, the Canon Thurston curve separates the two sphere into two pieces. You can color these two pieces black and white, or rather black and gray. And that's this picture here. The black is the bottom of the ball, and the gray is the top of the ball. Um, so I will show one last picture where I contrast Thurston's image with uh, or Thurston's algorithm with ours. And here is both of them together. So you can see that they, the two images, the two algorithms talk to each other in a certain way. Um, our uh, epsilon here is quite large, his is quite small, but we are still visiting, of course, the same cusps that he visits. So here's one more version of the same thing. And I think I'll end with that. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'd be more than happy to take questions. Unfortunately, I can't hear anybody. Thank you, Saul. I think we do have a little bit um, of, well, I think I, I wanted to bounce, if that's okay, questions that popped up in the Q&A during um, um, Q, um, maybe because they piqued my curiosity as well. Um, but the first one is from Steven Stadnicki, who asked, um, what is the earliest illustration you found that you would consider explicitly topological rather than geometric? What's the earliest? That's an excellent question. Um, and I think a lot of my answers will be cheating. Um, a lot of the really uh, okay, so so there are, let me answer with a with a story, perhaps. So I was a undergraduate, and I was um, trying to explain something to a uh, uh, another student and, and perhaps a student. And um, a professor walked by and looked over our shoulder and said, "Well, if you're drawing pictures like that, you're a topologist." So I think that um, illustrations of topological things have been appearing in papers for quite a while. For example, Poincaré's illustration of a Heegard splitting is just explicitly topological. 
there's no pretense of any geometric accuracy there. Um, so that's 18, uh, that's, that's uh, 1908. But, but there, are earlier, there are earlier examples in that. Um, so certainly, certainly in the, um, the, the German school, when they're you know, producing the classification of surfaces, there are pictures of surfaces in there. There's a beautiful picture by Hilbert. There's a beautiful um, book, excuse me, by Hilbert and Boss. Um, the exact name is escaping me at the moment, but it's like um, um, Geometry in the Imagination. Yes. My mistake. Ah, it's uh, Hilbert and Kahn Vossen, uh, Geometry and Imagination. And already there are topological pictures in this book. And uh, I think it goes back to the 1800s. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I I'm not confident about it earliest. So my apology. I hope that answers the question. I, I think I was combining sort of two two answers in one because I view like the picture on the screen right now, I view this as sort of an illustration of something topological. This is a picture about the figure eight knot and about the Kleinian group that the figure eight knot gives. But it's obviously a geometric picture. We used a computer to draw it and like there's, you can actually figure out where all of these cups are and they live in some uh, field, you know, they live in Q or join, the, Cube root of three and, and, and so on. Square root of three. Thank you. Um, I think in the interest of time, um, we might maybe continue to focus the questions in the Discord, but I wanted to let Aaron um, close us out. I wanted to thank Saul one more time um, for an amazing and beautiful talk and spanning an amazing amount of history for 40 minutes. Um, as well as including cutting edge research. So that's really hard to do. So thank you so much for that. Okay. Um, well, thanks, Gabe. And thanks again to all our speakers. And thanks again to all of our attendees for, for coming. Um, we saw a lot of great, uh, great geometry today and some dynamics. And uh, this seminar is called Illustrating Mathematics, which is a lot more than those things. We'll, we'll continue in future months and we'll see talks about number theory and probability and all sorts of other things as we as we go on. So please do keep coming back again. It's the second Friday of the month at this same time. Um, the uh, the discord channel uh, again has been advertised in the chat. Um, there's also a website that I put in the chat illustratingmath.org, where eventually not right away, but eventually the recording of the talk will be posted, um, except for the first three minutes because we forgot to press record. Um, but uh, Otherwise, uh, that's a good that's a good place to go uh, for resources about the illustrating math community and other events that are happening, uh, including this seminar. Uh, so thanks again to the speakers for showing us all sorts of interesting questions about not just how to illustrate mathematics, but how to generate mathematics from illustrations. And I encourage everyone uh, who wants to, who has the time uh, to continue on the discord channel and I will wrap up the webinar in a few seconds. Thanks again, everybody. Thank you to everyone for coming.